I sense his presence in the house. Oh, hallelujah. I'm convinced that God always moves where folks are hungry for him. Always. Amen. Turning your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I've been preaching the message of his coming from the epistles to the Thessalonians. As you're turning, I appreciate the men that came out, and Brother Jim, for organizing our men's meeting on Friday. We uh, probably had 30 or so men there, and it was a great turnout. We appreciate those that came. Amen. It was a good time. Also this morning, uh, Sister Hurley, Elder Sister Hurley, had to leave not feeling well. We'll remember her when we pray today over the preaching of the Word. Amen. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? Come early and pray tonight. Let's just have another one of those services where the Holy Spirit takes over and has His way. And let's just come early and pray to that end. 1 Corinthians 5, beginning at verse 16. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Make you wholly holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you who will also do it. Brethren, pray for us. Pray for us. I want to revisit verse 23. That will be the main focus. But Paul, as he closes this first epistle to the Thessalonians... He lets them know a prayer he's been praying for them. He said, I won't let you in on what I've been praying for you. I have been praying that the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many believes that Jesus is still coming? Hallelujah. I want to preach this morning on God gets and keeps us ready. God gets and keeps us ready. Hallelujah. Father, may your anointing be here. May this be an eternal moment. Just shut up our hearts to the truth. Remove every distraction. Holy Spirit, take my feeble preparation. And Lord, speak through that the meaning of this passage. And have the effect on every heart that you desire to have. Lord, you know everybody's need in this place. And I pray through the preaching of the word that you would address those needs. And may we leave here with a sense of eternity in our hearts. In Christ's name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. As you're seated, I would like to say, I see you're still here. Hallelujah. The rapture was supposed to take place yesterday at 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. A great earthquake was supposed to take place that would literally shake the graves open. The date was figured on exactly 7,000 years from Noah's flood, the first major judgment. Even Andrew was concerned about it. He came in the house last evening. He said, Dad, it's going to happen in a little bit. Because he had heard the, he had heard the Pacific time, 6 o'clock. He said, it's just about 6. And I said, no, you've got to figure the time. It's about 9 o'clock. I'm a little slow. Uh, Mark Lee texted me at 9.01 and said, did you go? <laughs> I shouldn't have responded. <laughs> Philip Carr said the atheists have already taken out a billboard that said for 2,000 years they've been saying 
just any day now. You see, although I believe in the rapture, I cringe every time an anticipated date is set. I don't like date sitting. Number one, it's unbiblical. From the mouth of Christ, no man knows the day or the hour. Secondly, I'm against date sitting because it increases the unbelievers in the rapture. Back in the 80s, just a few years ago, the same guy that set this date set another date. And every time that date comes and passes, there are more mockers and scoffers at the idea that Jesus could come again. This guy has done no favor to the gospel He's only increased unbelievers in the rapture. In the last day, there will be scoffers and mockers saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. But this they are willingly ignorant of. That one time God said it was going to flood. And yes, there was a long period of time when it didn't flood. And they said there never would be a flood. But the flood came according to the word of God. And so will the rapture take place. Another reason I'm against date setting. Because it takes passion from those who are looking for the rapture. I believe our source of Passion ought to be the scripture, but being human, Christians can get caught up in this because they would love to see the Lord come, and, and they hear messages of such as we've heard recently, and it stirs them up to the fact that Jesus could come, and then when it doesn't happen, the passion goes out of their expectation. One more reason, there's others, but I'm against date setting because it puts doubts in the minds who are already become complacent. At any given time, there are believers that are apathetic, lukewarm, complacent. And when something happens like this date setting and the Lord doesn't come, it just puts more doubts in their already set course of backsliding. Amen. All those things being said, you could have even bought a t-shirt before it happened from this group. It must have been a money maker for $18.50. You could have bought a t-shirt that said rapture ready. Your life ought to say rapture ready and not the t-shirt, but you could have bought the t-shirt. But that all being said, that disappointment of some folks being set aside, I want to say, I want to be rapture ready. I want to be rapture ready. And saying that, the Lord has given me a, a, a new a illumination of this truth. Being rapture ready. Is it a one time goal and state I achieve? But be, listen to me. Being rapture ready is staying within the process that God is working in my life. I want to say that again. That's the gist of the whole message from this 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Being rapture ready isn't just a goal I've achieved and then I'm there. But being rapture ready is staying within the workings and the process and the progress of God that keeps me rapture ready. I'm preaching it's God that gets and keeps us ready. One of my chief concerns growing up as a child and as a teenager and it continues to be today is that I want to be ready ready when Jesus comes and I don't want to miss out on it even today as a minister after all these years rarely does a day go by that I don't think am I ready for the coming of the Lord I think that ought to be the response of the message of his coming I mean climatic things are going to happen at his coming more than just an earthquake I mean that guy got it right in this there are going to be catastrophic Catastrophic calamities that happen following the coming of the Lord. I think the only response to the message of His coming is I want to be ready. I want my spouse to be ready. I want my children to be ready. I want my grandchildren to be ready. I want the church to be ready. I want somebody else to get saved and be ready. That's the only response. The sad fact is the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the 
less anticipation and expectation of it. Amen. The sad fact is there are a lot of folks that were ready five years ago that are not ready today. You say, is there no assurance of being ready? Yes, sir. You can have the assurance that you're ready. You ask the question, wait a minute. Preacher, does it take something other than the blood of Jesus washing your sins away to be ready? No, sir. It doesn't take anything more than the blood of Jesus washing away sins. But the point is, I must stay beneath that flow that they sang about. It just takes the blood, but I must keep myself in the place where he can continually and constantly wash me in his blood. Oh, hallelujah, it's possible. If we walk in the life as he is in the life, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, it cleanses and cleanses and I'm rapture ready as long as I stay within that process of the cleansing of the blood. Can you say amen? The honest believer looks at his life and thinks, how can I ever get and stay ready for Jesus coming? The good news I have to preach this morning is I don't get and keep myself ready. God gets and keeps me ready. I'm preaching something that could be liberating to some folks this morning. Hallelujah. In our text, first of all, there's the pertinence of sanctification. Some folks are, that should be verse 23. Amen, if you can help me out there. Some folks don't like to hear it, but it is going to be sanctification that gets and keeps people ready. Some folks don't want to hear it, but I want to preach and I want you to hear it this morning. Jesus is only coming after the sanctified and the blameless. He says it in this text. Paul said, the God of peace sanctify you. Your whole spirit, soul, and body preserve blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. On one hand, that strikes fear in my heart. When it says those that are going back with Jesus when he comes are the sanctified, the blameless. Has my life been blameless this week? That's the rapture ready, the blameless. But you know, we got to understand what Paul is saying. It's not he's saying that those that are completely perfect are going back with Jesus when he comes. He is saying those that are allowing themselves to be sanctified. They have put themselves in the middle of God's process and kept themselves in that process of sanctification. They are going to be ready when Jesus comes. I read it in the Old Testament earlier this week. God says to the Israelites, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Jesus said on his sermon in the mount, Be ye therefore perfect perfect. And I, I, I tell you what, I mean that's frightening. God told us to be perfect. I remember in high school there was a, a young lady I was witnessing to. She had been raised in a Pentecostal church. She had backslid. Her life was all about drugs and rock and roll concerts. And I remember talking to her one afternoon in drafting class. And she began to weep. And she said, Clifford, I really would like to give my heart back to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd really like to be saved. I'd really like to be ready for his coming. But there's a verse of scripture that bothers me and keeps me from doing. I was doing that. I said, what is it? She said, Jesus said, be ye perfect. And I realized I'm not perfect. And even if I got saved, I still wouldn't be perfect. She said, I just don't think I can ever be perfect. Well, two things. I believe God said what he cement we need to be perfect but number one we are perfect if we're being and doing what God wants us to be and do at any given moment amen if I'm following God right now there may be things that still need to be worked on in my life but if I'm responding to what he's dealing with me about right now I'm perfect that little kindergarten they they, they draw that 
picture and the teacher looks at it and says that's perfect amen it's perfect for a kindergartner it wouldn't be perfect for a 12th grader but for that kindergarten it's perfect now when that kindergarten gets into first grade there's going to be other tests and other assignments and they're going to be perfect for first grade and then perfect for third amen I've not arrived I'm not going to arrive till I get there but in the process I can be responding to God obeying God doing his will and at that moment I'm perfect that's consolation number one consolation number two is this hallelujah it's not up to me amen to get the perfection in my life that's what God does if I walk with him he'll put the perfection there he'll do the work he'll do the changing he'll do the modification he'll do the revamp all I need to do is walk with God and he'll do the work but it's pertinent. It's so blameless it's going to be ready. It's clear that one must at the moment of Christ's coming be blameless Walking in the light. I said a minute ago of Christ that had come five years ago. There have been some ready then that aren't now. Notice what it says here. We are to be blameless unto, literally until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't enough to be ready for Christ's coming in 2001. You need to be ready for Christ's coming on May 22nd, 2011. Brother Wilson, you've been in the church a long time. 20 years ago, there were people ready for His coming that aren't ready today. It's not enough to be ready at one time. We need to be ready all the way unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many believes He is coming? Secondly, I want you to notice the prayer for sanctification. That's all of verse 23. But he, Paul says, I pr- I'm praying for this. I'm praying that you'd be sanctified. I'm praying that you would be preserved blameless. Amen. Someone said to me this week, he said, you know, we grew up, talking about me and him, we grew up with preaching that you needed to be careful that you could stay ready for Christ's coming. I said, yeah, that's right. He said, but you know, if you're saved, you're ready. I said to him, yes and no. Because listen, I'm telling you, somebody can get saved this morning. All kinds of hang-ups, all kinds of habits. Things they stole and still in their house. Amen. Things unresolved. But if they come and confess their sins and put their trust in Christ and are washed in the blood, when they get up, they are rapture ready. Salvation makes you ready. But listen, salvation is not the end of what God does in our lives salvation is only the beginning I may be saved but I need to walk in that salvation I need to live that saved life I might have been saved and rapture ready but if I'm drawn away from the Lord if I'm turning my back on Him if I've grown lukewarm and cold and complacent amen. you say I don't believe that then you must believe like those others I've heard that if you one time been baptized and saved you can sit in a bar with your arm around a prophet prostitute half drunk and when the Lord comes you'll still be ready I'm telling you it's being saved that makes you ready but I must live that saved life I must be saved at the moment that he comes hallelujah that's why this is so important it's so important that it occupies Paul's prayer Amen. you got to understand something I told this one this week I said we're missing something here Paul is speaking to the Thessalonians they've all already been saved they've already been born again but he's praying that they would be blameless at the coming of the Lord so it's more than just one time in the past being saved it's responding to what God is doing in my life right here and right now amen amen he was not praying Paul was not praying that they would be saved but that they would be sanctified did you know this is so important such an important prayer 
that Jesus prayed it too. Before Jesus left his disciples, he prayed, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know, sometimes we think sanctification is just something that happens at an emotional moment at the altar. But I really believe this, not because I'm preaching, but because it's God's word. If you'll listen and receive the word of God this morning, you can be sanctified sitting on the pew and hearing the word of God. That was the prayer of Paul. It was the prayer of Jesus. Sanctify these disciples through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Listen, in churches, we don't need another pep rally. We need to hear the word of the Lord. The unadulterated word of God will sanctify us. Can somebody say amen? Amen. I pray not only for myself, but I pray for family members. Lord, keep them from evil. God, help them to keep the sin and the world and the flesh out of their life. It's an important prayer to pray. Sanctify me. Are you praying it? Are you praying it? Sanctify me, Lord. And then, I want you to notice the process of sanctification we've been talking about. This could be a whole sermon itself. I'm just going to have to briefly deal with it. But he said, I pray that God of peace would sanctify you holy. And notice the process, your whole spirit, soul, and body. If I had time to preach, I'd preach that sanctification is both something that is already done, and yet it's still being done. When you become born again, you are sanctified. Sanctified means set apart. You're set apart to God. You are separated from your old life. You are separated from your sins. Oh, we ought to shout. You're separated from darkness. And you're separated to life and light in God. The moment you get saved, you have come to the position of being sanctified. But having come to that position of being sanctified, you have only, you and I have only begun the process of sanctification. I've used it many times. Now I'm living it. And Micah, I forget when, but last year, end of last year, he enlisted in the army. Now he studied, he knows a few things. But the moment he was enlisted, he became U.S. property. He became a soldier in name. But he's yet to have the training. That begins January, uh, June June. 21st, somewhere in there, about a month from now, but he's yet to have the training. When he gets to boot camp and the rest of that training, he is going to begin to be in through the progress process. He'll become in practice what he was in position. He'll become in reality what he was in name. When you get saved, you are sanctified. Hallelujah. Set apart to God, but then the Spirit of the Lord, the Word of God, begins to work in your and I, my life to make us in reality what we are in name. Hallelujah. When you get saved, you're a saint. But then the Spirit of the Lord begins to make you a saint in all of your life. Listen, I know you're not. I'm speaking rhetorically, but I hope you don't just pass this off as boring theology. This is what the church world is missing. I get so tired of folks saying, well, they one time got saved, they're ready. It's more than that. It's a process. My salvation is sure. Yes, sir. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm sitting in a school class. I pass. Brother brother May in college, you pass a test. Hallelujah. (laughs) That's great. But there's another test coming. I don't mean to discourage you. It's an illustration. But there's another test coming. You pass one course and there's another course. And it's, But as long as you're passing, you're in good shape. As long as you're getting that pass, you're in good shape. I'm not saying we work for this. I'm saying we just follow God. Amen. God wants to take me way over there by the piano, but I can't do that right now. I need to do what He's asked me to do right here. But if I do it right here, I'm still sanctified. Hallelujah. I take the next step. God deals with me. I do this. I'm sanctified. So yes, I've got the assurance. I'm sanctified. But yet it's a process. 
God's trying to get me over here so that I'm blameless at His coming. Hallelujah. In any of these points, even if I'm following God, I'll be blameless. Amen. But here's what I really want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about the producer of sanctification. Amen. I believe this will help us this morning. Sometime, however my theology was, there were times I felt like it was all up to me to get my life where it needed to be, to be rapture ready. But if there's anything I want us to take away from this today, it's God that does it. Hallelujah. Look what Paul says. He said, the very God of peace sanctify you holy. I said hallelujah. The God of peace sanctify. It's God that sanctifies us. If I have my own righteousness, it's as filthy rags. But if I let God do it, He will truly and genuinely sanctify us. We try desperately to make ourselves holy and find out we're getting behind and becoming less holy. We despair that we'll ever get our ourselves ready. Amen. We find just when we think that we're ready we see something else in our lives and we say oh I got to take care of that too. But if we will let him. Amen. God will make us holy. God will make us righteous. And in that process the Bible, Paul said spirit soul and body. He starts way on the inside in our spirit. He sanctifies our spirit. He sets that part of us that can contact God he purges it cleanses it but then he moves from our spirit to our soul that's our personality that's our thinking that's our feeling he'll sanctify your thoughts he'll sanctify your feeling he'll sanctify your motives he'll sanctify your attitude he got in your spirit sanctified that sanctified your soul he'll even sanctify your body listen we fight the battle of bodily desires but if you let God He'll sanctify your bodily desire. I'm telling you, I believe salvation will do that from the inside out. Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life, spirit, soul, and body. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know this is just an outward symptom, but we have pointless arguments of whether a Christian should have a tattoo or not. I'm just telling you, I'm not talking about past. I'm talking about present. I'm just talking about if you really are wanting sanctified, you want everything about you to be sanctified, spirit, soul, and body. God does it. God does it. I become ready By letting God make me ready. Will you stay with me this morning? I know you will. This is important. I become ready by letting God make me ready. I cannot panic when I see in my life things that disturb me about not being ready. I cannot panic. I cannot become anxious and thinking it's all up to me. I've got to do it all. I begin to say, well, what if I don't get it right? What if I've made a mistake? What if I've overlooked something? But I can say, wait a minute. It's up to God to get me ready. (laughs) He's going to get and keep me ready. I want you to also notice, Paul said, the God of peace will sanctify you. I'm glad he said that. Now listen to me. I've got to hurry, but listen to me. A lot of people realize the need to be holy and blameless at his coming. But they've got themselves in an anxious feel quandary, thinking it's all up to them. They live in com- day by day full of fear and anxiety and frustration and consternation because they're not getting any hope more holy. I'm telling you, this is liberating. It's not the God of mean that sanctifies us. It's not the God who's looking for a mistake that sanctifies us. It's the God of peace. This sanctification should not be an anxious, paranoia-filled process. It should be a process of relying on God to do it. And relying on God to do it ought to bring peace in our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sanctification should be a peaceful process. I know we struggle with flesh. I'm not saying that. But I'm telling you, He's a God of all peace. How many believe the more we let Him sanctify us, the more peace there's going to be in our mind? 
Would you listen to me right here? Listen to me. A lot of Christians have their hearts and minds in turmoil because they are not letting God sanctify them. Amen? Can I say it again? A lot of Christians, young on up, they, they're Christians, but their lives are full of turmoil and anxiety and consternation because they're not letting God sanctify them. Because when He sanctifies, He's the God of peace. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad He does it? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I begin to think, for we move on. I begin to think, I've moved a few times. Moving is a hassle. How many likes to move? Pack the boxes. I've thought about this many times. When I move, I gotta go find the boxes. My, my wife and I, we gotta pack them up. Gotta try to make a bunch of phone calls and get the cheapest deal on a moving vehicle. And I've thought about these rich folks that when they want to move, they make one call. And the company comes in with the boxes and the blankets and packs everything up, puts it on the truck, <laughs> takes it to the new location, and the rich family just gets in the car, never pack a box, never move a refrigerator. They go to the new place, and when they get there, the movers got it all in there. I thought, oh, that'd be nice. Wealth won't buy happiness, but sure buys comfort. Some of us in this sanctification, we're trying to do all the packing, all the moving. We've got to realize if we give God a call, He'd do the packing, He'd do the changing, He'd do the move. We must go on. Now, having said that God does it, I want us to know there is our part in sanctification. Amen. I, I, in this conversation this week, this pastor said to me, he said, I don't think there's anything a person can do to stay and keep ready. God does it all. I, I agree with a part of that. I do believe that God does to sanctify but I do believe we have our part in sanctification there's God's part and our part I'll tell you what our part is our part is simply cooperation and obedience hallelujah with a whole lot of faith mixed in but let me just bring it down to this God does the sanctify but we must cooperate that's the only way you're going to get a cavity filled. You got a cavity, that thing's going to hurt you till number one, you make the phone call to make the appointment. Then you got to go to the dentist office. You got to sit there and anticipate. Then you got to go in the room, and when they say, get up in that chair, you got to get in that chair. He's not going to work on your sore tooth when you're up on the roof. You're going to have to get in that chair, and when he says, open your mouth, you're going to have to open your mouth. He says, keep wider, you go wider. Keep it open, you keep it open. Hey, Amen. You got to cooperate with the process if the abscess is ever going to be removed. You can't go in there, refuse to get in the chair, clamp your jaw tight and say, I ain't open my mouth. He'll look at you and say, I can't fix your tooth. Amen. We got a doctor here. Amen. The only way he can treat a patient is if they cooperate. I'm telling you, God, I don't have the ability to work on my own tooth. I don't have, I've often thought of that. I thought it might hurt a little less if I could do it myself. I've given a little thought to it, Brother C. So if I could get my cordless drill and get the right kind of bit on that, maybe I could do it. My, you can't do it yourself. It's almost impossible. An old dentist don't work on his own teeth. I mean, you can't do it. I can't work on my tooth, but I can't climb up in the chair and I can't open my mouth and I can't cooperate. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, it's that way with God. I cannot sanctify myself. I cannot make myself holy, but I can cooperate. I can say yes to the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Asher's not here to, to uh, 